Thank you, Pastor Kevin, for that wonderful word. And now we are going to hear from the book of Acts, chapter 11. Chapter 11 is a, a retelling of chapter 10. And so uh, we get to hear uh, how Peter explains what happened with Cornelius. So hear this uh, excerpts out of Acts, chapter 11. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. Continued in verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Raul. Good morning, church. My name is Pastor Scott. I'm super glad to be with you here as we continue this series. This text is a really important one for me personally. It has been really impactful for me in my ministry, my life. I can place myself inside this story. My hope today is for you, the community, uh, that it comes alive for you. Uh, so towards that end, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would open us up as your church, that your word would come uh, and become uh, just the living word. God, so open up our ears and our eyes and mostly our heart uh, to be enlarged, to understand your gospel for us, your people. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Our message t title today is called A Generous Grace. A Generous Grace. Uh, Acts 11, as Raul just said, is a, is a continuation in many ways of Acts 10. Acts 10 tells the story of Peter and Cornelius. If you weren't here last week or uh, tuning in, you can listen. Pastor Raul did a great job talking about the relational nature of Peter modeling the gospel, uh, the generous gospel, the, the simple gospel, sending Peter into Cornelius, uh, a Gentile uh, uh, military leader, and, and the, the spirit uh, descended and lives were changed, uh, the relational nature of the gospel. Um, this story, Acts 11, um, Peter retells what happens with Cornelius to the church, because you may find this hard to believe, but sometimes in the church, we don't like when new people are invited in. We're confused when God does a new thing. And I'm being a little bit sarcastic there, but like conflict is inevitable when God's in the business of changing people's lives. Conflict is ine inevitable. And so in Acts 11, the church hears about Gentiles being grafted in. They're like, what? And so Peter tells them the whole story again. I'll tell you a brief story from my life, how Acts 11 has really been a big part of my ministry here as a way of introducing the text. So a couple of years ago, uh, the teaching team, which is like each location pastor for Bethany Community Church, uh, Bethany is 100 years old, but it was only 10 years ago that Bethany North and Bethany West Seattle were launched out to start to take the gospel uh, into different neighborhoods. Now Bethany consists of six different locations, and uh, every year we'll go Away for a couple of days and we'll kind of create our content for the year ahead. We'll do team building and, you know, eat good meals and pray together and worship and, and meditate on Christ. And it's really a great time. Now, a couple of years ago, we were, uh, we were meeting and the next day's agenda was some pretty divisive stuff, some pretty tough stuff. We're going to, hey, tomorrow when we get together, we're going to be talking about the, some really important stuff about who's part of our communities and, and how we're going to do ministry. And, and I went to bed knowing that that was tomorrow's meeting agenda. This is a couple years ago. And we're at this luxury house that a congregant had gifted us, staying for free out in Eastern Washington. And I went to bed with a dissettled spirit. And so I, I woke up in the morning and I went down on the dock with my coffee and, and I was spending time with Jesus. And I was praying and I was asking the Lord for revelation, and I was reading through the scriptures. I happened to be just reading through, I'm always often reading a book of the Old Testament and a, and a piece of the, of the you know, wisdom literature of, of 
Proverbs, Psalms, you know, etc., and, and a book of the, the New Testament. That's kind of my rhythm. And so in my just New Testament readings, I opened, and that morning's reading was about Acts 11, about Peter and Cornelius. And I sat down on this dock, sitting along uh, the river there in eastern Washington, and I felt like the Lord was speaking to me. This message that God had given to Peter, to Cornelius, do not call anything impure that I have called pure. Don't, don't, don't do that, says God. Let me be the one to reconcile people to myself. And what I heard from the Lord that morning was that was invitation and relationships are, are meant to be, are, to carry the way of, of God's community, that we'd be tearing down walls. And so that morning on the river, this text was totally, totally shaping to me and sent me into my meetings that day with a different perspective. This piece from Acts 11. And the big idea today that I really want to open up to you in the moments that we have here is that the gospel, the story of Christ, we talked about a couple weeks ago, it's really important for us to be talking about the simple gospel, who Jesus is, is the heart of our ministry. The gospel of Christ breaks through off-limit areas and off-limit people in order to redeem all of creation with the truth of the generous grace of Jesus Christ. The truth of Christ is girded in this generosity and this heartbeat of our generous God who has folded us in. And remember, we are the Gentiles in this story. We are the ones that have been grafted into a family tree that we could have never earned our way into. We are the lucky ones. We are the, in the parable of the, of the 99 and the one, we are the one. So we should always have this perspective that because of God's generosity is how we're included into the family of faith. And so as Peter, you know, kind of gets part of this transformation story, this relational story of Cornelius receiving the spirit of God and like, oh my gosh, God is breaking down walls between Gentile and Jew. Now in Acts 11, the church in, 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 in Jerusalem, they, they send messengers like, wait, what is happening? And Acts 11, you get to kind of see what happens in the generous grace, not just of Peter's first time transformation, seeing the spirit of God come on Cornelius, but how he handles himself when conflict comes about in the church because Acts 11 is one of the most significant pieces married to Acts 10. It's one of the longest stories in all of the New Testament. I think it's pretty interesting because in the New Testament, for the New Testament writers, Luke in this case, he was writing the story of Acts on papyrus scrolls. These scrolls would be 35 feet long. And so they would have the predetermined length of the scroll when they would start to write. And so for the, for the, the gospel writers and, and for Luke here in the book of Acts and Paul's letters, he would, they would be writing with kind of an idea how the whole letter uh, would be constructed. And, and so the number of words that, that Luke would give to each uh, story and, and encounter is, is a big deal because his word count really matters. He's like, man, I only got so much room on this papyrus scroll to work with. So Acts 10, married with Acts 11, we're supposed to understand from Luke, this was a huge deal. The fact that this generous grace that new people are being grafted in and the church is being challenged because remember all the way back to Genesis 12, when, when God's people were established through the person of Abram, who later became Abraham, God's always in the business of transforming people, taking our old identity, making new identity, transformation for God's glory, giving us a new name, a new spirit. God speaks, remember in Genesis 12 to Abram, and he says, go to the land I will show you, and I will bless you in order to bless others. Like it's the Abrahamic covenant. And so all the way from the beginning, God says, my heart for, for, is generous. My heart will be for all people. There was always, even in the Old Testament laws, there was provision for outsiders. There provision for strangers. There's provision for widows. God was always generous. But from Abraham here to Acts 11, it's almost 2,000 years. It's like 1,700, 1,800 years. So the church's mind is blown because it's like, wait, wait, wait. No, we have an understanding of who is meant to be part of the fellowship. And Gentiles, those born outside of the Jewish faith, they don't fit the bill. This is not what we've been practicing in our table fellowship. You went into Cornelius' house. You shared a meal with him. You're inviting people to the, to the family of faith, Peter, and this feels at odds. 
And so they go and Peter tells them the whole story. And then it's remarkable. It says, when they heard what God had done, they had no further objections. And that line there in the midst of a really divisive time for us should inspire awe and curiosity that these church leaders from Jerusalem could hear what the Spirit of God is doing and they'd be like, yeah, it sounds great to us because they saw the fruit. They saw that Peter wasn't trying to be culturally appropriate. He wasn't trying to build a Twitter following. He, wasn't, he was just trying to be obedient. And he was doing ministry in the, the kind of impression of the generous grace of God. And when the other leaders heard this, they're like, hey, it's the real deal. Yet God's uh, you know, heart for all of humanity to be reconciled unto himself, when they heard that, they said, we have no further objections. If, really important for, them to under, for, for us to understand, though. They, they said here in verse 17, 18 of, of Acts 11, so if God gave them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Verse 18, when they heard this, they had no further objections. And then they said, they praise God, even the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now, for those of us listening, you're probably in one camp or the other because I feel like right now in the church we, we, we kind of tend to have more progressive ideals or more conservative ideals. And this kind of changes the lens in which we look at what's happening in you know, different issues in our culture around sexuality, race relationship, politics, etc. So for many people on a more progressive end, they read this story and they're like, yes, it's all about generosity. It's all about grace. Finally, thank you, Scott. Like, this is what we've been hoping for. Can Bethany finally live into more generous ideals about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? But here's what I want you to see in verse 18. It's very important to know what happens for the Jewish leaders when they come and hear about what the Spirit of God does. Listen to what they say. Even Gentiles, God has granted, what does he grant? He grants repentance that leads to life. Like what God grants through his generous grace is an ability for us as humanity to take our rightful place on our knees before the cross of Christ. And repentance leads to life. So the generosity, and this is where some of our more traditional or, or, or conservative voices are like, oh, finally, yeah, let's talk more about sin. Let's talk more about repentance. And, and this story challenges us in our unity in the modern church because both things are true. The generous grace says there'll be new people invited to the fellowship of Christ. But what we're invited to looks like repentance, looks like confession. I am a sinner saved by grace. And so if it's like, hey, everybody's included, yes, everybody's included to be brought to a place before the cross to say, my life is nothing but only for the grace of God. And so that's what the gospel story looks like, that there's this generous grace moving through this story. And the church kind of is like, wow, we, we, we had no idea that Gentiles were going to be included too, but there's a generous God. There's a generous grace. I told you like for me, you know, a couple of years ago on that doc, reading this story, it was profoundly moving to me. And then what happened I went into the meeting that day with this perspective that we must, as a church, maintain God's heart of generosity and grace that all people can be invited in. And Bethany Norris started 10 years ago with this perspective that we would be the church, that we would be a place that's reconciling people to Christ, bringing people to repentance, that we wouldn't be a white church, that we wouldn't be a necessarily a straight church, that we wouldn't be a, a conservative church. No, those weren't, that we would be a Jesus church. Like we want to look like Jesus. We want to be shaped to be like Jesus. And our hope is that more and more and more people are brought to the table of faith. And that's my heart, especially as an evangelist. My heart is constantly, where might we model the generosity of Christ, the, the grace of Christ in order to bring people what? To repentance. Like that, that's what God is asking us as a church to model. And so there's this generous grace, but what's really important in, in Acts 11 and really beautiful is what's the fruit of that? What, it, what happens here? What happens as, as Peter tells the whole story and, and as the church in Jerusalem kind of gets their mind around like, wow, God's heart is for Jews 
and Gentiles, free and slave, male and female, from every part of the Mediterranean at that time, black and white. I mean, everybody was included. And, and the early church was this reconcili- reconciliation kind of hotbed where everybody was looking at like, who are these people if not for Christ? Like, they don't look like any organization under the sun but for Christ. And that's why the church is always meant to look like this generous grace of Christ that bringing all people to repentance that leads to life. And that's where our boldness comes from. That's where invitation comes from. That's where if I can continue to shape us as a church that we would have a radical invitation that more and more people that don't necessarily look like how we might expect would be people of faith, that those would be the people that we're inviting in to our fellowship, inviting uh, to be in repentance that leads to life. So there's this generous grace and then you see the fruitfulness of the community that happens here in the second part of Acts 11. And you can look at this. It says in verse 45 of chapter 10, they were astonished that the Gentiles were included too. And we get that because it's astonishing when God moves in surprising way. One quick thing before we jump to the end of the chapter. When we hit conflict, Acts 11 kind of models like, hey, we didn't think that Gentiles should be included. What are we gonna do? Peter kind of models what we should do. We should look to scripture. We, could be, uh, we should be praying to the Spirit for revelation. We should be listening to wise elders and people that are, are deeply connected to the heartbeat of the grace of Christ say, what do you think we should do? And we should be looking for the way of love. We should be looking for the way of Christ's love to be made manifest. And this is where all of Jesus' encounter stories start to kind of reign over us, that Jesus continually broke boundaries to, to show his generous heart and, and his way of grace in order to bring people into fellowship with him. And, and Peter dealt with some criticism. You see this here in Acts 11. There's criticism when, when Peter kind of acts boldly for you know, what God gave him to do to bring Cornelius and his household to the saving work of faith, but God always cares about his church modeling this generous grace. So uh, just a practical application for that. Who is somebody in your life that God is asking you to stay in relationship with? Who is somebody in your life that you can, even though you might vote differently or believe differently about certain social issues, who might God be challenging you? Don't write them off. Maintain fellowship for the sake of the generous grace of Christ. Because remember all of us, we, we've been grafted into this new family faith. And so the end of this chapter is really quite astounding. What does it look like when a community lives into these values of the generous grace of Christ? It, verses 19 through, through 29 of, of Acts 11, I'm not gonna read it for you, but read it on your own. It says the gospel flourished. It said there in Antioch was where Christians were first called Christians. And it was made as an insult that there were the Herodians and there's people called Caesar, the Caesarians and, you know, all this. But it was the Christians. People were like, man, those people are always talking about Christ. Let's call them Christians. And the early church is like, yeah, it works for us. That's convicting for me because it should be Christ on my lips that people around me notice and see. Not my, not my perspective on certain issues, though that matters a great deal too. But first and foremost, am I talking about Jesus? Am I living like Jesus? Is my lifestyle consistent with this generous grace of Jesus so that people look around and say, there's something different when they see you, when your neighbors see you, when your kids see you, when, when the, your coworkers on Zoom see you? Like, is it Christ they see in you? Because Antioch becomes this kind of, this, this launching pad for the, for the church to flourish. Cornelius and his household have been grafted in. Oh my, God is more generous than we ever imagined. And the church flourished. They sent Barnabas, the early church did, to kind of find out what was going on. And then what it says is Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. I want to say to the men watching, it, that should be an encouragement to you. That, that your goodness is not measured by your bank account or your job title. A lot of times with men, it's like, oh, what do you do? What do you do? We start to measure ourselves by our job titles. Now, the measure of your goodness is by who God says you are and by your connection to the intimacy of the spirit who dwells in you. Like, take that place again in the family of faith. Your goodness has been given to you by the Lord.
Barnabas was a good man. And it said, in those days, he went and retrieved Saul from Tarsus. Remember two weeks ago? How long was Saul in Tarsus? Almost 10 years. And Barnabas went and got him. And it says here that Barnabas went and arrived and the grace of God, verse uh, 22 and 23 of Acts 11, when they saw the grace of God, that Barnabas was glad and encouraged and remained them, uh, and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught a great number of people and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And I love that story because for many of you who might be watching right now, you might feel like Saul and Tarsus. You might feel like you've been a little bit forgotten in this season. You might feel like it's been a really long time in your hometown and you thought God was gonna give you authority. You thought God was gonna give you a new name. You thought God was gonna use a calling in your life to do something. And, and in COVID, in 2020, you know, it's, it hasn't turned out that way. But I love the end of this text where Barnabas goes and retrieves Saul and brings him to Antioch and then they do ministry together. And so if you feel forgotten, if you feel like you've been waiting for somebody to come and get you, may you take your rightful place in the generous grace of our faith community. May you feel established. We hope you join one of our house churches this year, uh, this fall, to continue to lean into what God wants to do through you. And for the Barnabases that are watching, for those of you that have this connection to the Spirit and this is the season where God is giving you a platform, Go and look for Saul. Go and look for those people, those diamond in the roughs that maybe are, are, are kind of floundering. They don't know how they quite fit in the community. And may God use you as a great encourager because we need Barnabases. We need Saul's. We need to be a church that's living into this generous grace and bringing new people into fellowship with Christ to say, hey, good news, you're included too. Let's all be a people repenting and asking the Spirit of God to establish us as a faith community where faith can flourish, where the teaching of the gospel would live, where our relationships would happen because of the generous grace. Would you pray with me now? Jesus, thank you so much for this time, this place, your people. God, we're grateful for you. We love you. Um, we want to be a church that is living into these values of generosity and grace for your glory in this city. May it be so, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to close in worship today. Michelle and Mike are going to be leading us. And, and as you sing this final song, you know, pray over what you just heard. Where is the Spirit nudging you? What is the Spirit whispering to you? In what places is God asking you to be more generous and more full of grace? How might God be asking you to stay in relationship with people that might look different than you? And how might God establish you in your voice so that more and more people in our community can see Christ living in you? Let's close and worship together.